Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. I'm David Dodick. I'm the chair of the board of directors of the American Brain Foundation and I'm uh, delighted to see you all here tonight. This evening we're going to learn about why sleep, which I know all of us will do tonight, perhaps some better than others, is important for brain health, something I'm confident is of the utmost importance to all of you. The American Brain Foundation, as you know, funds research across the entire spectrum of brain diseases because we know that brain diseases are interconnected and curing one means will cure many. We know that about an estimated at least 50 million Americans suffer from a sleep disorder. And plenty of research now has shown a correlation and an association between sleep disturbances and numerous neurological diseases such as stroke, cognitive aging, dementia, Parkinson's disease, and others. And it's this association which illustrates how one issue can lead to many brain diseases and why we say that when we can cure one brain disease, we will cure many. It's also why the American Brain Foundation has invested more than $36 million in research grants to almost 300 researchers across many different brain and neurological diseases from ALS to multiple sclerosis to Alzheimer's disease and many, many others. The American Brain Foundation's most important partner is our founder, the American Academy of Neurology, which is the world's largest association of neurologists. And every research grant we make is thoroughly vetted uh, by the American Academy's top scientists. So our foundation is committed to sharing valuable resources and increasing public awareness of brain disease. And our virtual salon events like this one tonight are opportunities to connect with you and experts in various topics of interest around brain diseases. And tonight's topic is obviously of um, utmost importance and of interest to every one of us. So let, let's move into our topic of sleep tonight. And we have a, a very esteemed guest speaker tonight, Dr. Phyllis Z. Um, it's hard to do Dr. Z's biography justice, but I'll tell you that she is the Benjamin and Virginia T. Bosch's Professor in Neurology and Professor of Neurobiology at Northwestern University. She also directs the Center for Circadian and Sleep Medicine and is the Chief of the Division of Sleep Medicine at Northwestern University's Feinberg School of Medicine. She's the past president of the Sleep Research Society, the past president of the Sleep Research Foundation, the past chair of the NIH Sleep Disorders Research Advisory Board, and she's the current president-elect, and probably president now, uh, Phyllis, of the World Sleep Society. She is the recipient of many scientific and academic honors, including the 2020 Sleep Research Society's Distinguished Scientist Award, which is their highest and most prestigious award for original and sustained scientific contributions to the field. Speaking of contribution, she's published more than 300 peer-reviewed papers um, in, in the field, and her research interests are quite vast and include the effects of age and neurodegeneration on sleep, circadian-based interventions on cognitive, cardiovascular, metabolic uh, diseases and their ability, and the ability of these interventions to delay cardiometabolic aging and neurodegeneration. And recently her research team has also been interested in the use of acoustic and electrical neurostimulation to enhance slow wave sleep and memory in older adults. So uh, there's no one better actually to be speaking to you tonight on the topic of sleep, why it's important uh, to maintaining a healthy brain. And Dr. Z, welcome. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you very much, um, David, the American Brain Foundation, and Jane for inviting me. It's really a great pleasure for me to be here, to be able to speak about a topic that I'm really uh, enthusiastic about. And I'm just going to give you a bit of an overview of why sleep, and not only how much you sleep, but when you sleep, which is the staying in rhythm component is really important for brain health. So as all of us are quite aware, one of the most dramatic changes, physical changes that occur in our daily cycle is the rotation of the earth on its axis. 
and therefore the strong light and dark cycles, sleep and wake, metabolism and rest, uh, etc. So it's really from the very beginning, I think that sleep, timing, circadian rhythms, and energetics, where there is fuel metabolism at the brain, in the neurons, or in the peripheral tissues, are very much tied together. Cooked? And you will be able to see that. Is it of sleep? Course, when you look at behavior, you're really looking at the, the synchronization of this with a light dark cycle, with activity levels, with unfortunately our youngsters here are exposing themselves to light at night, which can disrupt sleep and circadian rhythms. And then as we get older, which will be uh, a bit of a focus today, uh, about some of the sleep problems, especially waking up in the middle of the night and being unable to get back to sleep, and what are some of those consequences for uh, brain health. Before we do that, I just wanted to kind of remind us of some of the fundamental, I think, basic science um, evidence that's really changed at least my way of thinking about how broad and important the role of sleep and circadian rhythms is both for health and disease. Of course, sleep is a uh, situation where you know, you're, 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 you're resting, it's, a, it's what we call a global brain phenomena, but we're beginning to recognize that sleep itself can be a local brain phenomenon, can occur in specific parts of the brain. And so, for example, if I tap my fingers 50 times today, tonight when I sleep, that gets replayed in that part of my brain with this kind of slow activity. And we also know that sleep is genetically regulated and not the EEG or the brain waves, but certainly this rest activity cycle resides in every cell uh, of our body. Similarly, the circadian rhythm or these near 24 hour biological rhythms have been shown to be genetically regulated and they exist in almost every cell of our body. And they're integrated not only for typing information, but into how metabolism, immune function, and neural pathways are being regulated. And this is a, just a beautiful, I think, figure that shows that you look at an area of the brain called the suprachiasmatic nucleus, or what we call SCN, and that is the master clock of the brain. You can look at lung, liver, uh, or fibroblasts from the skin, you can see they're all rhythmic. These cells in central tissues as well as peripheral tissues are all rhythmic because they contain that same molecular clock machinery of rest and activity. Not only are they all rhythmic, but whether you look at the brain tissue, muscle, digestive system, liver, etc., you see that each of these tissues are cycling in phase with each other. So there's not only clocks everywhere and rhythms of sleep and wake everywhere, but, but they're synchronized with each other to produce this um, alignment between these different functions. And for that, I believe, the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine 2017 was given to the discovery of the molecular genetic mechanisms underlying the generation of these circadian rhythms because the implications are hugely, are very, very broad. As I said earlier, they exist in every cell of your body, right? So it doesn't matter which tissue you're talking about. But the very central part is this master clock in the brain called the suprachiasmatic nucleus. It's oscillating with, and, and it's this genetic machinery that keeps it going in this 24-hour cycle. So it's endogenous to us. But of course, one of the most important things that we we, that this, this is endogenous rhythm needs to be in synchrony with is that of our external light darks, like the sun clock, right? But in addition to that, we have the sleep-wake cycle. We also have feeding, when you eat, how much you eat, the type of nutrients that you eat. They all provide information back to the central clock, and this central clock then provides integrated information to all these peripheral tissues regulates sleep and awake, regulates food intake, and they really affect each other. Now, we don't, fortunately, you know, most of us don't really live according to the sun clock because we're indoors like I was all day today. And therefore, light at night can certainly affect our system, can, can, can really create detrimental effects to our sleep and circadian systems. 
not only light at night, but insufficient light during the day. So all of these are factors that we can use to manipulate the health of our sleep and circadian system. So as I said earlier, it is not a surprise that when you have a disturbance of sleep or circadian rhythms, the timing of it, it has broad implications for neurological functioning, for metabolic functioning, like in diabetes, uh, even cancer. The World Health Organization has classified shift work as a potential carcinogen because it's associated with such a high increased odds ratio or risk, for example, for breast cancer. And more recently, we've been doing work actually in pregnancy that, it, that, that this changes in sleep and circadian rhythm increases the risk for adverse pregnancy outcomes and fetal uh, growth. So it's really quite broad. But today we're going to focus just briefly on the brain health. And the, 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 as we age, one of the most important things is that we want to avoid neurodegeneration or it's this race against the clock, such as an Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, are the most two common um, neurodegenerative disorders. So conceptually, we tend to think, at least um, I'm a little bit older, so many years ago, I used to think, well, if you have neurodegeneration, then of course the brain, you know, it's going to affect circadian rhythm and sleep because it is a central uh, mechanism. And that, that can lead to more neurological impairment and sleep problems. But I'm going to show you some data now that seems to indicate that it's bidirectional, that changes in sleep and circadian rhythms early on, 10, 15 years before any evidence of neurodegeneration, at least clinical evidence for neurodegeneration, may perceive that therefore sleep and circadian rhythm dysfunction may be a risk factor for neurodegeneration. So I think this is very, very exciting, very simple data, but very elegant data done by Andrew Lim's group. Uh, and they use a little watch like your Fitbit, right? And what they found was that, and, and the A and B are just activity records. So this is like, you know, the movement at the wrist. You can see in, in, this, in the A part here, this individual has a few awakenings between, let's say, 11 p.m. and let's say about 4 a.m. You see some of these awakenings here. And during when, when this person is awake, it's pretty, you know, there's a lot of physical activity here. Now look at panel B. This individual has a lot more sleep fragmentation in their, in their sleep period, right? And so what he found was over, the, you know, over a course of six years, at baseline, none of these individuals had cognitive impairment or Alzheimer's disease. They followed for six years. So he found those who look more like in panel B, who had more sleep fragmentation, were the ones who had a cumulative probability higher of getting Alzheimer's disease compared to those who had better, um, less fragmentation of their sleep. And very similarly, if you look at the composite for just cognitive decline, not just Alzheimer's disease, similarly. So more sleep fragmentation, which is common as, we, when, as one gets older, is associated with increased risk for dementia. Another, another type, another sleep um, I, I guess parameter that really changes with age is deep sleep or slow wave sleep. And this just shows you how quickly it goes down, especially in men, there are sex differences here, that really by middle age, the amount of deep sleep goes down dramatically. And just bear attention to why slow wave sleep is, is important. So I'm gonna show you a, uh, a beautiful study done by Bryce Mander, who was one of our my PhD student, but also now is uh, a really leader in this area. He looked at PIP imaging, which is amyloid imaging, and looking, if you look uh, horizontally, the more red there is in this brain, the more amyloid deposition there is. In, in panel B here, what you see is the EEG or the brain waves. And in the, in the red here is where there's more of that slow oscillation or this deep sleep or slow wave sleep. And then in the, low, in the lowest panel is where the slow wave activity or slow wave sleep is located in. It's really in the prefrontal area and in the frontal cortex. What you see is that the lower amount of deep sleep or slow wave sleep is associated with, with increasing deposition 
of A-beta amyloid, which is one of the proteins that, 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 is, uh, that accumulates uh, in patients with uh, Alzheimer's disease. So there's this relationship, less low weight activity, more uh, beta amyloid. If you look at some of the uh, animal studies, but also uh, more recently human studies, why might that be? It looks like in sleep, there is this increase in the ability of the fluids within between neurons to be able to flush out these large molecules, let's say like A beta amyloid or tau, these are large molecules that if they build up are toxic to the neurons. And you can and, and you can see that this is what it's showing. It's using the cerebrospinal fluid tracers between wake and sleep. So there's more of this flushing out of this of these uh, toxic uh, or, or these waste products of metabolism. This is also beautifully seen, I think, in this uh, in this functional imaging study uh, done by Fultz et al., where they show that these these ripples of CSF, um, you know, dynamics in 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 the brain is preceded by slow waves. So it's not just the blood flow, but it's this activity of the neurons during sleep that seems to precede this flushing. Of these, of these waste products. So you can kind of think about that um, during sleep, the lymphatic flow is activated. And because the brain has lymphatics, but it's not very good, it's mainly through the lymphatic flow. It's like you're really sweeping up, you know, uh, the waste uh, during sleep. So very, very exciting work, which then seems to imply from David Holtzman's work and, and that of many others, that sleep quality, especially decreased amounts of deep sleep, which occurs with aging, may be one of the sources by which there's an increase in A beta amyloid, these waste products, this toxic activity that then could potentially lead to something like Alzheimer's um, disease. So we can look at this functions, you know, like a, uh, this, like where I said earlier that neurodegeneration can lead to disruptive sleep, but I think more and more we're beginning to see that disrupted sleep itself could be leading to, uh, could increase the risk for uh, Alzheimer's disease through perhaps one of the mechanisms is the sweeping of the brain, sweeping of the toxic materials. So uh, in the next few minutes, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about the potential for this now. If this is the case, then it's in a bi-directional way. So what can we do, right, to improve sleep and circadian function in aging, both for prevention, but also for treatment, because it can increase connectivity, plasticity. And so it really becomes this aspect that if we can improve sleep and circadian rhythms, can they be these targets for disease modification and some of these age-related uh, changes? So one of the things we talked about was that there was a decrease in this deep sleep, right? The slow wave sleep, deep sleep. So can we boost it? in older adults. And one of my uh, graduate students, Nani Pat Palombos, which is shown here, she did that for her PhD thesis. So what we did was we devised this um, method where we could stimulate with sound um, these deep slow waves uh, every time that it occurred during sleep. And by using the sound, we were able to boost the amount of deep sleep in older adults, as well as those individuals with mild cognitive impairment is just shown here. And this is exactly what happened was that we would put a signal here. It's a little bit of a pink noise. It's like 50 milliseconds in, in five on, five off blocks. And we're able to boost slow wave activity in older adults whose slow wave sleep was already diminished. And what we found further was that it did affect, it, it was correlated with improvements in memory. So the older adults were able to recall the, the word pairs that they learned the night, the day before, better the morning after this acoustic stimulation. And it was, it's, it's not much, it's about 25% more words, so it's not huge. But the interesting part was that the amount of improvement in memory was correlated with the amount of improvement that we were able to boost 
the slow wave sleep or that deep sleep that we just talked about. Just another really quick example of the, of the uh, power and potential of sleep and circadian um, interventions. This is a study done by Alex Vidanovich, who was a KORD at the time, but now he's a professor at, uh, at the Mass General. He used time bright light therapy in patients with Parkinson's disease. He gave them two weeks of the bright light um, uh, two times during the day, in the morning, and then also in the afternoon, early evening, compared to dimmer light, which is about 300 lux, which is very similar to what we would experience right now in a room. What he found was that in the bright light condition, these patients with Parkinson's disease uh, became less sleepy, so this is the upper sleepiness scale, improved their sleep quality, decreased the fragmentation of sleep, uh, and also improved daily physical activity levels. It increased that and improved the total uh, Parkinson's disease scale. So it was a bit unexpected, but just something simple like that, um, I think shows the potential of this. So I'm gonna end just with a message. There's a lot more data in this area, but the message is that really sleeping well and maintaining regular rhythms is really important. Keeping a regular schedule of seven to eight hours of sleep is gonna be important for most uh, individuals. Appropriately timed light and feeding is something that we're beginning to learn more about as also being important for health. Regular exercise, young or old, uh, and especially getting that light uh, during the day with exercise. And finally, there's only one way uh, to live a long life is to age. And uh, successful aging is probably related to all of this. So um, thank you for your uh, attention. And I, I think I can open it up for some questions now. Thank you so much, Phyllis. That was terrific. So if anybody has questions, feel free to open your mic and ask them or type them into the chat. And I don't see any real questions yet, um, but maybe I'll start. Phyllis, um, how much is enough and how do people know that they're getting enough? Um, because if, you know, everybody's sleep is disrupted from time to time and perhaps nobody sleeps all the way through the night. So how do, how do people know consumer sleep technology? Is that, is that helpful? What would you, how would you answer that? Well, there are individual differences, uh, David, as, as you already alluded to. The one, uh, one way, at least clinically, is how do you feel during the day? Are you able to carry out the activities of, of daily living? Uh, are you able to stay awake uh, and be attentive? Uh, are you falling asleep uh, during the day when you don't want to? So these are just small litmus tests, but they don't really get to some of the data that we're talking about, whereas like, you know, once you recognize that there's decrements in your performance, it's probably, you know, if, if you were to do testing, you already would see it much, much earlier on. So it is the regularity of it. Absolutely, we all get a bad night's sleep here and there, right? So to have insomnia, you have to have at least three nights, right? In which this occurs on a chronic basis for three months or longer. So it is that regularity. And um, how much is enough? Well, we, I, you know, the recommendations is seven to eight hours for adults. Maybe a tad less now for older adults, uh, just because for whatever reasons, about seven hours seems to be good. But there are individual differences. There are mutations in some in some animals where they they're very short sleepers, and they don't seem to have clear adverse you know effects on their on on their cognitive abilities. But it's yet to be studied, so there's going to be variations. So if you're only getting six hours of sleep and you're doing great you're in great shape, everything. I probably, as a physician, would say, don't worry too much about it because that's going to cause more problems. Yeah. Dr. Z? Yes. Parkinson's. Um, they rarely get into REM sleep. 
long before they are actually diagnosed, does this then contribute to um, Lewy body disease? Yeah, we, we, we don't know, but you're absolutely right. Uh, patients with, uh, who eventually become clinically, who develop clinical Parkinson's disease, years before that, they will have, not that they don't have REM sleep, what they end up having is what we call REM behavior disorder. And that is when they're actually able to act out physically their dreams. So they have dream enactment behavior. Usually during REM sleep, we are intermittently paralyzed. So we don't act out. Imagine if you could act out most some of your latest dreams, it could be dangerous. And so it is a prodromal syndrome and people are studying this uh, right now very, very much. How early is it and what does it mean uh, as far as, but, but, but your answer, Really right, and it may have to do with where um, some of the early early pathology of Parkinson's um, disease begins. Right, sometimes it's in the gut and also in the brainstem. So this could just be an early sign that it's um, already affecting certain areas uh, of the brain. Well, it's true. We still don't know if it starts in the brain or in the gut, which right. <laughs> so right. yeah. Exactly, but the but the but the sleep part is really really interesting because it is an early it, it is it, it is it, it's seen as it, it, it does you know if you have RBD idiopathic RBD you it does increase your risk of having um, Parkinson's disease or at least what Correct. we call the alpha synucleopathies not so much Correct. Lewy bodies yeah thank you and also Lewy body disease. Uh, very much, even stronger relationship with Lewy body disease. I'm seeing more people with Lewy body disease than I have been in the past years. Yeah, <clears throat> they, they, that, that's it's the, the, the connection is even tighter with that. And, and, and what's interesting is the people who have RBD, REM behavior disorder, they're more likely to also develop cognitive problems. When they when they have Parkinson's disease, yeah. so there's that Parkinson dementia connection that seems. That's to be interesting. That was uh, a, I think there's a question here about pharmaceuticals. What about using pharmaceuticals to get deep sleep, and is there a big downside? Yeah, there are not too many pharmaceuticals that give you deep sleep. There are some. Some of the GABAergic, like um, something like. Uh, gabapentin maybe to some extent, but most of them, unfortunately, even if they induce deep sleep, they induce deep sleep all night long, and then you wake up feeling kind of like hungover and tired. Deep sleep, it isn't just more, it's better. It's also more at the beginning of your sleep period is better, and no, almost none at the end of your sleep period when your REM sleep is, is better. So there's the, the slow wave sleep is like a measure of the sleep pressure, homeostatic sleep pressure. So it's high during the beginning of the night when you go to sleep and then dissipates uh, across sleep. So good sleep quality is probably a bit of this dissipation of this uh, slow wave activity. It's just a measure. It's not the slow wave activity itself, but it's a measure of neuronal. <laughs> Phyllis, you showed in one of your research studies that acoustic stimulation can increase slow wave sleep, um, especially perhaps in older adults. Is there anything commercially available that people can actually use? Well, ours is not commercially available, but um, it, there are, there, there's at least two that I know of. Um, there, there are these headbands that uh, also measure your EEG similar to our system, and they are available. I, uh, there's some data with both of these. I just, it's a black box, so I don't really know uh, exactly what the algorithm is. We have uh, worked with uh, one of them uh, as well, but there's that potential that there, there are some that are out there that, um, that will, that, that, you know, there's data to show that they do boost <clears throat> slow wave sleep, much less about what the clinical and our clinical outcomes are. So very little on cognition, very little on metabolism. This is something that I think we need to try in patient populations. Yeah. Any negative side effects from chronic melatonin use? Uh, tough question. 
Well, if you're going to take melatonin, unless you have REM behavior disorder, take it in small doses. And I think that's important. Uh, half a milligram, one milligram is more than enough. Having to take three or 10 is just like really, really pharmacologic. High doses of melatonin can affect your, car your vascular system. It can be vasoconstrictive. And it's been recommended in patients who have, you know, belay by hypertension of not to take high doses. I'm not aware of really, um, you know, warnings about chronic use of melatonin <laughs> in, in low doses. But, uh, but remember, melatonin is not a sleeping pill. It is not a hypnotic medication. Melatonin is a chronobiotic, which means it works on the circadian system, and it can help promote sleep by decreasing the arousal, the, the alerting signal from the, from the circadian clock. And with aging, our melatonin level does go down. So the studies have shown that those who have low melatonin levels, if they use it as a supplement, that they may be beneficial effects uh, on, on their sleep. So there's just not enough data, David, for me to either say yes or no um, to answer that question. But so far, I would say if you're going to do it, and if it helps you, take it in smaller doses. And by smaller doses, Phyllis, what, would you, what do you normally recommend to your patients? If I want to <laughs> shift the clock, I usually only use half a milligram, and that's available commercially. Um, for sleep, if you increase the dose, you're going to get maybe some soporific effects of it. So I would say one to three milligrams is probably good enough. Mm -hmm. That would be my high dose, except for RBD, right? Except for the treatment of REM behavior disorder, where for whatever reasons, we need much higher doses. The question here about what is the best way to method to measure sleep? Um, not everybody can go into a hospital and get an overnight sleep study. Um, so what's the best way to measure sleep and all these consumer technology devices that people use, Fitbit and there are others. Um, can you talk about that a little bit? Yes, of course. Uh, most of those don't directly measure the brainwave sleep that we're talking about. However, of course, when you sleep and especially different stages of sleep like slow wave sleep or REM sleep, there are also changes that accompany that in your body. And that means your heart rate changes your autonomic output changes, your immune system changes, uh, so, and the temperature changes. So based on these sensors that look at heart rate, uh, look at temperature, look at your activity levels, and then you put those into artificial intelligence and you put those into algorithms, they're actually not bad at predicting uh, sleep versus wake. They're actually quite good. Uh, and uh, some of the newer algorithms, this is all basically more, it's more really about software than it is about hardware, that um, it can actually help distinguish deep sleep from light sleep, for example. Mm -hmm. the, so yeah, I think sensors are great. The advantage of sensors is that um, you can do it every Brett? day. Whereas when you go to a sleep center, <laughs> you can do it one night, how representative is that, right? Yeah. Of, of your sleep. And we said earlier, it is that chronic, it's your daily regularity that makes a big difference. Hey, Robin. The question here about um, sleep aids, is that a good way to increase the amount and quality of sleep? And two of the sleep aids or sleep medications I see used a lot are trazodone and Seroquel. Mm -hmm. um, could, you, could, could you comment on, on those medications and how you see those as being useful or not so much for sleep? Well, if melatonin is not a sleeping pill, neither are those two, and, and, and they certainly can have more side effects. So uh, neither, what, of course, uh, one is a, not an antidepressant and the other is an antipsychotic, a typical antipsychotic. They, we're using it for their side effect, right, which is sedation. It's, it's really their side effect. Now, I don't want to bash trazodone too much because although uh, the, the uh, Sleep uh, Academy, we don't recommend trazodone, there's very little data on trazodone, but I would think that it probably does work, right? So many people are taking it. It probably does work. 
but the but there's very little data. The data seems to indicate that it can help people fall asleep and maintain their sleep. No long-term studies, and it seems to reach um, tolerance. So you start with 50, and then you go to 100. So that's the problem with uh, something like triazodone. And it's got a very long half-life, so daytime sedation, hangover could be another problem. I personally don't see a role at all for quetiapine <laughs> or Seroquel, uh, unless this person uh, has a comorbid, what we call psych psychiatric condition or underlying condition that would require that. Then sure, of course, why add another medication? But as a sleeping aid, I have seen this a lot as well. Uh, I would not recommend it. The side effects, cardio metabolic and cognitive, otherwise just, the, you know, the risk benefit ratio is just not in favor of that. Yeah. There's a question here. Um, uh, there are nights I'm awake, my body's exhausted, but I'm not going to sleep. I don't know why I'm awake. I don't feel like I'm worrying, I'm just alert. What's going on with that? <laughs> yeah, so uh, this is something, uh, sounds like what I would call chronic insomnia disorder. Yeah. And there is one type, uh, one hypothesis, which is, you know, which there's data for, is called a hyperarousal uh, type. That means that it's almost like you're in a fight and flight mode by your brain all the time, and it just doesn't shut, it can't shut down. So you can be exhausted. So patients with insomnia are not necessarily sleepy. People are sleep deprived, are sleepy. People with this kind of hyperarousal insomnia are tired. They're fatigued. They're fatigued. It's mainly fatigue. The um, and in the brain of these individuals, if you were to do this, the the uh, imaging scanning, uh, like the uh, functional imaging, what we see is that during when they're actually sleeping, the EEG shows that they're sleeping, but there's a lot of glucose or metabolic activity going much more in those people with insomnia who say, you know, I'm wide awake, I can't shut my brain down. Mm -hmm. um, even though they're behaviorally sleeping compared to those without insomnia. And then during the day, there is less metabolic activity in that frontal area of the brain. And perhaps that can explain the, the attention, maybe the fatigue. So I think uh, it's something to seek attention to your doctor about and say, I have this problem because there is um, help for that. One of the things you can do other than medications, of course, is cognitive behavior therapy, because that is top down to kind of decrease that cognitive um, arousal. So. Great, there's a question here. Is it okay to stay up late till two or 3 a.m. Um, and wake up late, 10 or 11 a.m., as long as I get seven hours of sleep? Um, that comes from a night owl. Yes, I do that when I, when, when I can. Mm -hmm. So uh, I am also a night owl. So yes, um, it's not, um, the idea is that the health of the system is to get the sufficient amount and quality of sleep at your right circadian time. So it has to be synchronized to your own biological time. If you're an owl, that's your tendency, right? To be, to sleep. Because it's gonna be really hard for, 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 for us to make you go to bed at 10 p.m. You're not gonna be able to sleep uh, anyways. Now, if you have a job that allows you to do that, good for you, and it looks like you, you'll be, it, it's, it's a healthy behavior. But unfortunately, uh, for many individuals, they do have to get to work by eight o'clock or seven o'clock. And therefore, we have a circadian medicine clinic in Northwestern, and we try to use light and melatonin to shift your clock to an earlier position so that you can fall asleep a little bit earlier and wake up earlier. But that's only if your work or social circumstances require that. Mm -hmm. It's better to live with your clock than against <laughs> your clock. So. I think everybody will remember that one. Um, I might use that actually, Phyllis. There's a question here, very practical question. I've heard that naps can make up for a lack of sleep at night. Is that true? Uh, 
Probably not. I would say perhaps. The, it depends what kind of NAFs we're talking about. Uh, I think, David, you mentioned earlier that, well, most of it, you know, it's probably you don't have to sleep through the night. You can, and I think per, perhaps humans are also like some, uh, like many other species, that we're probably not necessarily have to sleep eight or seven consolidated hours during the night, that we may be also biphasic sleepers or at least triphasic sleepers. So there's a first night, first sleep, which is early on, the first three hours, and then there's the second sleep. If you read these old books, you'll they actually talk about first sleep and second sleep, actually. And but this is before you know all these lights, you know all these uh, Edison got all his uh, all, all the artificial lights and everything else. Now, the nap. If you take a nap in the middle of the day, especially between one and three p.m., that's normal. That's natural. You will all of us get that afternoon dip. But that nap is probably not if you take multiple naps, it's not the same mm. as getting your seven hours or at least your four hours of sleep at night. Why? It's because sleep cycles. It's not just a sleep. You have slow wave sleep. You have stage two sleep. You have REM sleep. You may not get REM sleep in your naps, for example, and you need REM sleep as, as well um, for mood regulation, for your memory regulation. So, so so sleep, it isn't just about the amount of sleep, but also the type, the quality, the different stages of sleep. And there's what we call sleep architecture. So if you plot these different stages of sleep, it looks like a building, you know, like multiple buildings. And you'll see that you go into deep sleep, and then you go, you cycle out of deep sleep, and you go mm. into lighter stages of sleep, and so forth. So there's a function to that. And I think that's important. That's why it cannot take the place of your nighttime sleep. Yeah. There's a question here. I wake up most nights feeling fully awake and can't return to sleep. I've been told this is an adrenaline spike. What causes this and what can be done about it? Well, either it's an adrenaline spike uh, or it could be a clock issue um, as well. So if your clock is running a little faster, especially as we get older, um, your, your rhythm is shifted so that three o'clock in the morning is really six o'clock in the morning uh, before. Uh, so it could be a clock issue, it, uh, it could be a circadian issue, or it could be, like you said, there's this, the, the, the arousal system is heightened already at that time. Or your buildup of your slow wave activity during the day, your homeostatic, your metabolic need for sleep is diminished. Um, it could be, so the, the, how we treat this is to build your daytime activity to increase your boosting your sleep during the night and or to shift your rhythm if that were the case. Yeah. You mentioned, Phyllis, that sleep is, in, is associated with dementia, Alzheimer's disease, chronic traumatic encephalopathy. One of the things that these have in common, of course, is they're um, related to tau deposits or tangles in the brain. So someone has the question here, what is the purpose of tau? in the brain why is it there? i don't know david you can answer that better than i what is the role of tau in the brain well actually the you neuron. know think think of a train track right yeah. you've got the two rails and then in between you've got these pieces of wood right tau is the piece of wood that keeps the rails together and what what goes down those rails are neurotransmitters and neuropeptides the things that one nerve uses to communicate with another one. So, you know, we have a very complex biochemical and elect and um, <clears throat> yeah, biochemical factory in the brain. And that's the way, you know, neurons, one cell connects with another cell and communicates electrically, but it also communicates chemically. So it's important to push those neuropeptides and neurotransmitters down the track so that it can get out of the neuron and can communicate with other neurons. And tau actually connects those two because once once the once tau comes apart, then all the then they're then they're off the rails, so to speak, and everything can't get down and be transported along the along the axon to get out and communicate with other cells. Um, that's how I describe it. What about you, Phyllis? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I, I think the other thing about tau is that 
if you, this is something that now David Holtzman's group is really, it was all about amyloid. Now he's actually looking at tau. Sleep is the same thing to tau. And um, in addition to that, there's the changes in the shape, right? The conformation of these proteins. And sleep is, has been shown to be important for that as well, for, for, for the conformation. So it's not only, you know, where they're fitting, but also if, they, if their shape changes, clearly uh, what Dr. Dodik was saying about the, the shuttling of the neurotransmitters, uh, like, the, like the rail, like, like train tracks, is going to be really messed up, it's shuttling to the wrong places, or basically getting stuck, yeah. right? Yeah. It's getting stuck, yeah. Yeah, and if it gets stuck, then, then the cell dies, and all that tau aggregates, it clumps and deposits. And if you don't sleep well, as Dr. Z said, it, sleep is important to flush all of that out of the brain. And if you're not sleeping well, then that those tau deposits can get stuck in the brain and cause death to other cells as well. Um, let's see, what about REM sleep behavior disorder? You, we mentioned that a few times in sleep. Can it be improved? If you have RBD, what can be done about it? Yes. Um... The, the treatment for it, it actually is, uh, my first line treatment for it is melatonin. It's, um, and it requires high dose melatonin. Usually we start with almost like, you know, we try to start with one milligram, but three milligrams and uh, up to about six to nine milligrams. <clears throat> now I don't fully understand, a melatonin has receptors, but this is probably not a receptor mediated uh, effect. I'm not sure. Uh, melatonin has receptors in the periphery as well, but I don't understand why such a high dose is needed for that. Uh, I, th there's been some explanations, but I don't quite understand that. Uh, but it can decrease um, RBD, uh, both the expression of it, and also uh, we in the, in the brain waves, in the EEG and in the atonia, we see some decrease uh, in the muscle activity. Clonazepam is the good old tried way. I mean, I'm sure this is what I used to use when I was um, younger before we even thought about melatonin. But th that's tricky because in old, these are usually older adults. They also may have sleep apnea. And now you're adding a benzodiazepine. So usually our first line is now melatonin uh, that can be useful. Melatonin in high doses also, I mean, I'm not Posing high doses, but melatonin in higher doses appears to have antioxidative effects as well and anti-inflammatory effects. So potentially, uh, it's been touted as potentially having neuroprotective effects mm -hmm. as well. Uh, all of that, the data is mm. fairly inconsistent, but hey, um, at least in animal studies, it seems to indicate that it has that potential. Does the spectrum of daytime light, apart from the lux, make a difference in sleep morphology or architecture? Absolutely. Thank you for that question. Um, yes, lux is probably not a good way. Uh, we're gonna once I get a little smarter and start talk, stop talking about lux and start talking about spectrals, uh, spectral, and the spectrum, the wavelength the color uh, and the temperature of light. So absolutely, so across the day, in the morning, what it, it, at, at, uh, at dawn, it, it's orange, right? And then begins to get whiter and whiter, but it's really getting bluer and bluer. That is short wavelength light. That's what your circadian system sees the most because your clock system uh, in your retina uh, has these, these receptors that are sensitive to blue light, to, to the short wavelength light. That's why it's important to get light in the morning um, because it is that type of light. And then as day goes on, the spectral changes back to almost, the dusk becomes almost like, um, like dawn. And uh, so I always say, live with the sun clock. <laughs> Don't live against your clock, but also try to live with, a, you know, according to the, live with the sun clock. It's really your best uh, idea. So now, uh, there's circadian lighting or what we call dynamic circadian lighting, and that's what it's doing. It's like they're the programmable of, uh, ways now in internal lighting to create this normal spectrum of light across the day. Mm -hmm. 
There's a question here about cannabidiol or CBD, Phyllis. Um, this person says many of her patients uh, are using it, beginning to use it and experiencing some effectiveness and the ability to sleep more soundly. So what say you on CBD? Yeah, I was afraid you would ask. Um, I think that it's mixed, right? The data on CBD for sleep is mixed. And as you know, uh, it's CBD. You could have, you know, there are different components of it. it it's mixed. But there are some studies in older adults, actually, that shows that it may be beneficial. And I do have patients, <laughs> of course, I come, I don't tell them don't use it. Uh, but then I don't, I can't tell you that it will be uh, helpful. I think that in some people, like the, the person who asked this question, in some of their patients, it can be, uh, it can be uh, useful. The, the data shows that in some people, it can, uh, that there's some data that shows that improves sleep. It actually can increase melatonin levels uh, as well. Uh, maybe that's one of them, but there's some studies that also show that uh, it may be detrimental to sleep, mm -hmm. that it helps you relax, that's for sure. And so that may be more the sleep maintenance component. So I think it's going to, at this point, we don't have large trials uh, in this area. And I think it's going to be dependent on the components, the particular composition of the chemicals um, in CBD or other formulations. Yeah. THC, for example, is more stimulating. Yeah. Question here, I was diagnosed with sleep apnea, but not had much success with ResMed machine or other sleep aid devices. What are possible options to using the machines? Um, options other than using the machines? I, I guess that that's, I mean, there are many machines, there are many masks. I, I think it's still the, the, the first thing to try. If you have kind of mild to moderate sleep apnea, uh, some of the oral appliances can be useful. This is something that your den dentist or your ENT uh, physician would fit you for. If you have moderate to severe um, <laughs> sleep apnea and you have not been able to tolerate CPAP or any of these other devices, there is a surgical procedure which is called the INSPIRE method. And this is a glossopharyngeal nerve stimulator. So it stimulates your tongue when you're sleeping. It keeps protruding your tongue so that it opens up your airway. The data is actually quite reasonable with this, but of course it's a surgical procedure. Um, there is another device that just came on the market, um, which is you use it during the day, actually, not mm -hmm. during sleep. It trains your tongue muscle to do this, this protrusion. So it's almost like a stimulator for you training your muscles um, to do that. It's called, it's, I think it's called something like Excite. <laughs> I think the brand is called Excite. So these are all possibilities, but uh, you certainly should be speaking to your uh, physician about that. But, the, but there are many other options, including bigger surgeries like um, mandibular advancement surgeries. But there, but you should, don't give up. Um, there's quite a few things. And the other thing is, is if you can't tolerate the CPAP because you also have insomnia, for example, uh, look into that as well because the treatment of insomnia can also help you tolerate the CPAP. Thank you, Phyllis. Um, question here, I'm a caregiver to my husband who's in uh, end-stage dementia. I take lorazepam nightly to reduce stress and aid in sleep. Is this safe or smart? I would recommend, uh, if this is a chronic issue, I would recommend speaking to your um, primary care doctor or, or someone to address this issue. Uh, benzodiazepines on the chronic, it's, it, you know, they do help and clearly they work. There's a role for those. But on a chronic basis, there may be uh, potentially better solutions. Yeah. Especially in older adults because of the balance issues um, that, what, that we encounter with this class of medications. Are there sleep issues unique to urban as opposed to rural dwellers, especially in the 20, 20th or 21st century? Yeah, I think a lot of it is because we are urban dwellers. Uh, 
especially you know people who have trouble falling asleep, they're late people like myself, but I'm sure that if I live in the Amazon and I actually have experiences, uh, I actually became a morning, I could wake up at six o'clock in the morning because the light was coming in, there was nothing to do at night, it was pretty dark. And so some of it uh, is, has to do with our lifestyle, uh, a lot of the behaviors. And that is, I think, hugely important for us to recognize because those are indeed modifiable factors that we can, we, we can address. And just simply that last slide that I had was get that light during the day, get that exercise regularly during the day, eating, okay, don't stop eating three hours, stop eating three hours before bedtime, because all of that is going to change the signals to your brain about, uh, about sleep. Oh, so there's an individual who says that they've been told that their disruptive sleep is due to spikes in blood pressure due to PTSD. Um, nocturnal hypertension, do you see that? And Yeah. So one of the ways to look at your sleep is by your blood pressure. You know, there's this beautiful dipping of your blood pressure, especially with uh, this deeper sleep. And yeah, so PTSD uh, tends to, it, cause, it has associated with sleep fragmentation, but also very much with REM sleep, right? It's, it's really one of the REM sleep uh, potential disorders is like dream anxiety attacks. Um, and there are treatments for that as well that uh, addresses the REM part of it, which then can um, address the, the vivid dreaming, the, the really uncomfortable vivid dreaming, and, and it's more than uncomfortable associated with PTSD. So one of the signs of not great sleep is this nocturnal hypertension. Yeah. There's some good questions here on you know, the influence of IV ketamine when it's used for mood disorders on mm -hmm. sleep and uh, vitamin D and uh, alcohol. Maybe we don't have a lot of time, but what, what about ketamine since that's first on the list here? Yeah, you know, well, you wouldn't use ketamine for sleep, uh, but uh, when it's used with mood disorders and, you know, when it's prescribed that, it does seem to also help with sleep because ketamine, remember, is like, it's an anesthetic, so it will affect um, your sleep at the cellular level because it changes your membrane. The, so, but it's not for sleep. It's not, it's way beyond that, um, nor is propofol or anything like that. But it, one of the effects, of course, is, is sedation. Alcohol, yeah, you know, a glass of wine with dinner, sure. But alcohol for sleep, no, it actually will disrupt your sleep later on. It suppresses REM sleep as well as uh, slow wave sleep. And you can get that rebound, you know, later in, in the morning. You may wake up wide awake with that. And so, um, not not for sleep. Don't use alcohol for sleep. Use it, you know, take you know alcohol for enjoyment uh, with your with your dinner. Uh, what was the other question? The other one was vitamin D. Oh and... yeah, vitamin D is good for everything, right? Every, so. It's, don't take too much because it's lipid soft. It, it's a lipid based, um, but yeah, uh, vitamin D, there's some studies that show that it, it seems to help uh, both mood, right, uh, and sleep. Again, very little real, like, solid data, but I would say it doesn't seem to me to be harmful, I, you know, to take one, one vitamin D supplement per, per night. There was a question by Kirsten, Kristen. Yes. She's been trying to raise her hand. So oh, I'm sorry. Kristen, yeah. I'm sorry. Um, I had a stroke. Um, how many hours of sleep can I get for good sleep? If you can get um, all the epidemiological studies tend to indicate that seven hours um, is probably okay, seven to eight hours, but seven hours. If you go below six hours, that's where some of the risk factors begin to really uh, increase. There's a U-shaped curve um, with that. So I would say um, probably seven hours would be a safe bet for, for most people, seven to eight hours. 
but if you're getting consistent less than six hours, again, talk to your doctor about it. Uh, there are individual differences. I have friends who only get six hours and they feel marvelous, but they don't have any, but since you've had a stroke, uh, take, you know, just take a look at that and, and clearly improving your sleep health is going to be important. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Kristen. Well, I, we could keep you for a little while longer, uh, Phyllis, but we are one minute over time here. So I think we'll have to end the session tonight. I'm sorry we couldn't get to everybody's questions, but uh, that just means we'll have to bring you back for an encore presentation, Phyllis. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Well, thank you all for attending. This is great to see people interested in sleep and uh, sleep well. Yes. Everybody have a good sleep. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you.